Oh, Kalita uh, is back. There she's it is. back. She's oh, she's back. back. Okay. Okay. Are you there then? Kavita, where are you? Oh, there she is. Oh, there she okay. is. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's continue then. Okay, good. Let's continue, everybody. All right. So equanimity is the basis because from this, once we started to recognize it, and of course, starting intellectually, that everybody, all the uglies and all the nice ones and the pedophiles and the psychopaths and the murderers and the misery ones and the lovely nice people, they're all the same from this one's very specific point of view. It's something that even, I mean, you could even argue all of Buddha's teachings are, are driven by this, this recognition that every living being, every ant, every dog, every psychopath, every saint, given that we're samsaric beings, we're driven spontaneously, automatically, instinctively by the wish to have pleasant experiences and pleasant feelings and the wish to be free of unpleasant feelings and unpleasant experiences. It's fundamental. And we're, all we're trying to do is recognize that. So it needs you got to squeeze your brain a bit because we're very emotional, you know. We've got to recognize that fact, and it's got it's got nothing to do with deserve being a good person, being a bad person. That isn't the issue here. So what we're trying to do here on the body Sattva path is by recognizing that this is the basis. This is the first, and then on the basis of this, we can then begin to grow the wish that every one of them be happy and the wish that every one of them be free from suffering. And then as we keep moving through these stages, we're developing this outrageous, brave attitude of the Bodhisattva. That it's my job. It's like the job description of a Bodhisattva. It's like they're the mother of every being in the universe. And it's my job to make them happy, to find them, to give them, to help them in whatever method I can, help them find happiness and help them find freedom from suffering. That's the bottom line. And that's the, it's the short, it can be the, include the short term. So you don't just sit there and think oh, I'm going to be giving person the method to get enlightened, but then all they want is a cup of tea. Give them a cup of tea, please. So the, I think we've got to talk a bit more too about the what are bo these bodhisattvas, how they behave, what they are there. I mean, you, that's why it's so inspiring to read. Maybe we talked last week about this. You read about the bodhisattvas. The great, and they're the great saints, basically. I know as a Catholic, I was a little girl, and I was in love with Our Lady and God. I loved God. I didn't care much about Jesus. I didn't know much about Jesus, but I loved God, the concept of God being everywhere. And I loved Our Lady, you know, being a cat, and the saints. So I read all the, a lot, not all, a lot of the biographies. And I was so moved by that. And that's why it's so inspiring to hear about real living beings. That's why it's so inspiring to hear stories about the Dalai Lama. I think I told stories, you know, when you realize there he is actually the embodiment of this, you know, that it's real, it's possible, it's possible. There are people who have accomplished this and they're right here on the planet now. So it inspires us, you know. So don't put it up in the sky, these holy beings kind of above everybody. No, no, no. They've got, they, they, they deal in the world, you know. The wisdom wing, best way to do the wisdom wing is give up sex, drugs and rock and roll and go to the mountains. That's the best way to get the wisdom wing done. But the compassion wing, you come down from the mountains and you join the universe. And the best place where help sentient beings is where sentient beings are. You know, we all sort of yearn to go off into the trees and have some peace. That's nice. But sentient beings need us. And where do they all live in the big wacko cities? You know, they live everywhere. But, you know, so that for so suffering and suffering places are grist for the mill for these bodhisattvas because they have such courage. So we're gradually going to grow this powerful attitude of it's my job. And that's, so then you've got, that's called great compassion. We're, we're moving there. We're going there through these 11 techniques. I'm just sort of describing more the qualities, you know. So compassion is the general one that defines the Bodhisattva path. May you not suffer. But the unique characteristic, the one that's unique to the Bodhisattva path, is this special level of compassion that comes after regular compassion. And it's called great compassion. And it's a technical term, not just some nice gooey feeling. Mahakaruna. And this is the one, this is the specific one. So compassion is you see someone suffering and you go, oh my God, look at that suffering. That's compassion, already pretty amazing. But the next one is the crucial piece. What can I do to help? That's the brave attitude of the Bodhisattva. And this is something, you know, that is really hard to, really hard to cultivate. We can see, you know, just now 
um, having some discussions with different people, some you know, about people getting lonely, us people feeling loneliness, which is a massive suffering. I read somewhere in the New York Times, I mean, an article about how it's the greatest, it's one of the biggest diseases of the, of the American world, the, of the United States, it's the whole world, obviously. But let's analyze for a second what, what this loneliness is, you know. Loneliness is this thought that I am separate from others, isn't it? Which is a primordial function of ego grasping anyway. And then on the basis of this, there's this huge attachment, this hunger, this emotional hunger, and we're all the same, to, to be happy. And that means when you're feeling you haven't got, when you're feeling lonely, it means you haven't got people. There's no one to talk to. But the usual way it expresses itself is there's no one who loves me. I've got, I've got no one to love, or, and there's no one who loves me. There's no one who takes care of me. There's no one who looks after me. I want others to be happy, but they don't love me. They don't. So what you, the, the predominant feeling there and the words in the mind, but we don't notice it. And I'm not trying to be cruel about us, is where is there somebody who can love me? Now, the point here is, if we can be brave enough, the attitude we have to shift is, what can I do to make others happy? How can, instead of where is there somebody to make me happy, the whole shift we have to make, and this is not even getting anywhere near body Bodhicitta yet, but it's the essence of this whole approach, is what can I do to make other people happy? And we can see without being corny about it, it's so evident, you know, that when we can have that attitude, it's not possible to be lonely because you're thinking of others. I know when I first heard all these teachings and I kind of, I got annoyed, you know, all these Pollyannas running around helping everybody else. And often we can misunderstand this. This is an interesting point. If we haven't done the wisdom wing properly, we haven't worked on our own mind. If we haven't understood our own attachment, our own neediness, our own misery. And if we haven't learned to let go of that, which is what fulfills our needs, we're gonna misunderstand this. And so the commonest thing is you've got people I like call it the good girl syndrome, you know, you're a really good girl, you're not angry, you do your mummy's little helper, you run around helping everybody, but you're, you're lonely inside, it's because you haven't given up attachment, you haven't given up your aversion, you haven't given up your depression, you don't even notice these, and then we don't have this attitude in our culture. So you are being kind, but then you come home exhausted and lonely still. Because it's your kindness and your goodness is there, but it's still polluted by your misconceptions. It's polluted by your attachment, by your hunger. So in other words, the person who's nice is driven, it's suffering when it's driven by your assessment of yourself as being a nice person and the hope and the hunger that someone will see you as a nice person. Then you will definitely be lonely. So loneliness is attachment to being seen and heard and approved of by others. And this is the deepest attachment we've all got. It's the hardest one to see, you know. So the shift we're making here on the compassion wing is how, to, what can I do for others? And there are lots of examples of this, people we know in our own lives, especially during the pandemic, you read all these marvelous stories, like even little children, one little boy I remember reading about in the Washington Post, little kid, little, you know, little cat, fat, little, he was a bit obese. He was always being bullied at school, you know, he'd be sad and crying. And then he kind of, he got this little heart and he decided he read about some old people not having enough food. And he thought, I can do that. I can do something. So there he was before he knew it with his mummy helping him getting kind of truckloads of food to old people because he's a seven year old little boy. In other words, he had the thought, what can I do to help? It sounds so simple, but when you're overwhelmed by your own misery, it seems so hard and it almost seems cruel. What do you mean I should think of others? Where is there somebody to think of me? But it's hard to hear this because it sounds like you're criticizing me, you know, but it's so obvious. So this is, a, this is one of the proactive. So in the wisdom wing, the practice is to get up, give up the attachment and the craving to be seen by others. And here on the compassion wing, the practice is to actively think of others. They're both different approaches, but you can, you've got to do both, you know. If you keep only trying to help others, but not work on your own mind, you're still driven by attachment and neediness and, and, you, and you're helping others will be limited and it'll still make you angry and unhappy and depressed because you haven't changed your own mind. I hope you're understanding this point. It's really huge. So people who help others, but not having too much attachment, they cannot be lonely. It is not a possibility. It is impossible because you're content within yourself and contentment within yourself, contentment contentment 
being content with yourself. This directly comes from working on your own mind, getting rid of your own anger, your own attachment, your own jealousy, your own depression. And of course, that's hard. We don't think like that in our culture, you know. So the, in other words, the result of the, of, the, of the wisdom wing, just the wisdom wing, you're not proactively thinking of others, but the result of the wisdom wing is that you are more content and therefore more loving towards others. That's why you've got to have that as a prerequisite. We've really got to understand this, you know. But here we're talking at, we're looking at the quality that we're trying to cultivate of what can I do, which is the great compassion. This comes about number seven in these 11 techniques. So we're not, you know, it's not that easy. Are we communicating people? Are there any questions? We might have to go a bit over time today to finish everything, I think. Are there any questions about what I've discussed so far? I mean, I'm just, I, I, you know, I'm trying to be precise, but I always just in rave on, you know, so maybe I'm confusing you. My raving on confuses you. Are there any questions? By the way, incidentally, if not, that's perfectly fine. Did you get up? Uh, somewhere. Yes, Kevin. This uh, thank you, Venerable, for your teachings. This may be um, a circular question, okay. but um, if part of our practice is the renunciation of attachment, uh -huh. do we not then reestablish an attachment with our desire to help others and go through all this training? Is that just not enough? I hear what you're saying. No, I hear what you're saying, Brian. Kevin, the key here is the understanding of the definition of attachment, and therefore more broadly, this it's this clear distinction that Buddhist psychology makes between the delusions and the virtues. And this is something that's utterly unique to the Buddhist view. And until we get this point, you, you, you'll never get an answer to your question. You, it'll, never, it'll never be evident. So when you understand that attachment in its nature, and therefore anger, depression, jealousy, all the voices of ego, that they by definition are polluted, are eye-based, are fear-based, are only the cause of suffering and cannot cause you happiness. So when that's what we, it's sort of like you, you're beginning to learn botany and you're learning to distinguish between attachment and love, for example, which is a weed and a herb. They look on the face of it, identical. You can't even see the difference. So here we have to learn the distinction that attachment is in its nature poison. So if you were driven mainly by attachment and didn't have much love, let's say, you'd be a, you'd be what the world calls a psychopath, basically. You'd be primordially self-centered. You'd be an aching junkie who'd be utterly miserable. We don't realize how intense attachment is. And the irony of why we don't understand how bad it is, is because we have access to love and compassion and virtue and goodness there are saving grace so it's harder ironically to see the attachment so the key to understand is the use of the word attachment or desire when we just when we discover that when, when we're looking into the delusions the, the the neurotic states of mind the afflictions as buddha calls them they are in their nature neurotic deluded liars misconception and only the cause of happiness only the cause of suffering now when you say to develop this powerful wish for others to be happy desire quote unquote if you like that by definition is not the attachment we're talking about that is a, a positive wish a positive aspiration a positive desire it's a virtuous state of mind because it's not rooted in, in ego grasping so right now of course our wish to help others is polluted by attachment we can't see the difference between them but we've got to as we first understand intellectually the difference between a virtuous and a non-virtuous state of mind then we gradually cultivate the positive ones and weaken and lessen the negative ones are you with me? Yes. It, it, my understanding of what you just said revolves around the word intention. No, didn't say that at all. Okay. No, okay. So you mean by intention, you mean technically motivation, do you, Kevin? So the motivation. You're meaning motivation. You mean the thing that underpins your wish, underpins something you do. Is that what you mean by that? Yes. Okay. It's more than that, Kevin. It's more than that. It's much more than that. No, the fundamental point I'm making, and this is what we've learned in the wisdom wing, is the Buddhist psychological view, this, this presentation of all the state of mental consciousness. Mental consciousness is all our thoughts and feelings and emotions. There are millions of them. And the Buddhist model divides all of them precisely into three categories. 
And this is the unique one of Buddhist psychology. We don't talk like this. It's more than intention. I mean, the most advanced levels, it could be that. But here, the point is, we have to distinguish what is attachment. What is attachment? And if we're looking in the third, the first category is the deluded, neurotic, eye-based, fear-based states of mind. The second category are the virtues, the reasonable, valid, useful, virtuous states of mind. The third category, I like to call them the mechanics of the mind, like concentration, um, good memory, all these technical parts of our mind that are neither virtuous nor non-virtuous in their character. So the key to this is understanding that the character of attachment, if you were mainly having attachment, you would be a junkie. You'd be dilute. It's a lie. It exaggerates the deliciousness of the object. It's completely rooted in the ego grasping, the root delusion. It's frantic. It's hungry. It's a little vampire. And if it were mainly you had attachment, you would be like what the world would call a psychopath. That's attachment. Attachment. Now we also have attachment, but you also have access to your second, comp the second category of states of mind, Kevin, you, you, you've got access to patience and empathy and kindness and love and compassion. And they are the ones that temper your attachment, which ironically makes it harder to see the attachment. So the key first point is you've got to recognize there are states of mind that are in their nature, polluted, deluded, liars, misconception. And there are some in their nature that are virtuous, reasonable, and valid. That's the first step, first point. Now, now, motivation on the body suffer path plays a massive role. And there are ways that we can use, transform attachment. So let's just say you've got attachment to chocolate cake. I mean, it, you think about it when it's not there, you exaggerate its deliciousness, you feel there's something missing, all this is a characteristic of attachment. You've got this emotional hunger, you feel you're not enough, you haven't got enough, then you think, oh, chocolate cake, then you, the thought arises, then the attachment over-exaggerates its deliciousness, and then you manipulate to get the chocolate cake, and then you put it in the mouth, expect happiness. This is whole st stages of conceptions arise that we have to unpack and unravel in order to understand that attachment. Now, on the first level of practice, there's no wiggle room. You just learn to give it up. You learn to control your body and you don't put more than one piece in the mouth and you learn to work with that attachment and unpack it, unravel it. Now, if you, when you get to the body such a path where you're now going to focus on helping others, you might then, you know, you'll invite someone for dinner and they offer you, you know, a piece of chocolate cake and you know you're really attached to chocolate cake, but they made it for you. So you don't want to be rude and say, no, I don't want to eat it because I'm trying to practice giving up attachment. You will happily, before you shove it in the mouth, you'll think how kind they to offer me this chocolate cake i'm going to eat this so it'll be uh, you know thank them for their generosity and their kindness so that will temper your attachment it'll calm your attachment down so then then because your motivation is pure that attachment is not so negative but it's still attachment are we communicating a bit better now yes thank you Okay, because attachment finally, you know, you can say, oh, well, I'm going to kill somebody because I'm addicted to killing, I'm attached to killing, so but I'm going to try and kill for their sake. I don't think so. So we don't, I don't care about your motivation there. You're not advanced enough. The greatest body bodhisattvas can do that. They're easy. They can use attachment and add virtue to the mix and make even the action virtuous. We can, but th that's a more advanced level. The very first one is, can, first of all, control the, 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 the servants of attachment and don't put the second piece of cake in, control your hand. Second level is now get into the attachment itself and understand and unpack and unravel it and see how it's a neurotic, ridiculous state of mind. Then the body suffer path because you're more, pra you're more practiced now. You can even be, you know, like even um, like Lama Zopa says at the time of death, for example, there's this powerful attachment that arises, this junky grasping, which is this freaked out fear that comes because you're, 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 you're letting go of the eye, which is so attached to. But he says you can use attachment. So, you know, one of the functions of attachment is to hold on to what you've got. Another function of attachment is to look forward to something. We spend our lives anticipating the next minute. Now I'll do this and now I'll do that and now I'll have cake and now I'll go there. We never stop. That's a function of attachment because we're never satisfied with this moment. So by the time of death, you can utilize that attachment of always looking forward to something by looking forward to your human rebirth. A person who's, you know, has faith in God, they can look forward to going to heaven. That's attachment, but you're using it wisely. So, but you can't use it if you haven't first understood it. You with me a bit? 
Yes. So Thank the you. desire, hang on, Kavita. So the desire to be to, to benefit others, we use the same word, but it's got nothing to do with attachment when it's pure. It's this huge wish based on compassion, based on empathy, based on connectedness with another that sees it is my job to help them. May I become a Buddha to benefit sentient beings? That's got nothing to do with attachment. Thank you. That helps yeah. a great deal. Okay, good. Fantastic. Yes, Kovita. Uh, Venerable, could you just please clarify the difference? A lot of times we talk about, we use the term attachment instead of love. Re does? Related to- Kovita, sorry, stop. Who does? Who uses it? Well, non, non Buddhist. You might. Non Buddhist. No, no, no. Non Buddhist. So okay. I think, what, for example, so the question. So the question um, could you please, in with respect to the subject being a person, could you please uh, clarify why love and attach, uh, why attachment? Well, we've just, we've just seen what attachment is, right? We've just, I, I just described it to Kevin, didn't I? You with agree? respect, Venerable, you were mostly talking about attachment with regard to things like chocolate cake. Who gives or, a damn in hell? It's the same attachment, Tobita. I just described in detail what attachment is. It's a junkie, eye-based, that sees the deliciousness of an object and sees that when I get it, it'll make me happy. That's attachment, whether it's to your dog, your husband, or your cake, there's no difference. So now, then you've got, I, you say about your partner, you don't say it about your cake, you say about your partner or your poodle, I love my poodle. So what does that mean? That means you want them to be happy. It's very simple, that's the difference, that's it. It's, it's other based. Attachment is I based and, and love and virtues are other based. The delusions are I based, the virtues are other based. That's the difference. It's massive, of course it is. But for us, we have them together. We can't see the difference. And it's advanced to see the difference, Kovita. To actually know in your mind that you're coming from attachment as opposed to love is enormously difficult. But that's what we have to do to become our own therapist, to see the difference. And we can't know the difference if you haven't studied it. How can you know the difference? How can you rush off and be a gardener and know the, until you know the difference intellectually between a herb and a weed? You can't, you've got this, why my point to Kevin, we've got to understand this basic point of the Buddhist presentation of the characteristics of a delusion and the characteristics of a virtue. Once we get those clear, it is easy. The answer to your question is easy, Kovita. So in recent, in relation to Kevin's original question, he, he was uh, imagining that you give up attachment, but when you develop bodhicitta, you reignite. He, I'm thinking about Kevin's specific question. Okay, so he what's your question in relation to Kevin's question? Yeah, so how would you explain that Kevin's use of the word attachment from the point of view, I think you already have, but in other words- have, Kevin, I've, done all my, I've just done it the last 15 minutes. You mustn't have been listening. Forgive me being blunt. I've just answered it in detail. So this shows concerned, Kavita, yeah. so this shows how difficult it is, darling. Yeah, I'm venerable. I'm sorry. I was I was concerned that um Okay, I know what you're concerned. You're running point, around. I know already, Kavita, you're running around minding everybody else's business because you think you're trying to make sure everyone else is happy. It's not your business. If they want to ask questions, let them ask it. If you know the answer already, then you be quiet. Thank you, Venerable. Are I we will... communicating? Yes, we are. Stop trying to make everyone happy. This is this is mis misplaced compassion. Um, they're all grown ups. I can notice they're not babies. They can all ask their own questions. If they're not clear, then they can ask the questions. If you're clear, then don't confuse me by asking the question. Are we communicating or am I misunderstanding you? I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you don't know. So you mean you didn't hear my answer to Kevin I did yes. hear your answer to Kevin. So then, where? So then, you, but you didn't help you. Didn't help you get the answer clear, though. You didn't. It didn't. As help you pointed you. out, I was projecting onto Kevin that because you were using chocolate cake instead of a person. That God in heaven, I'm exactly right, Kavita. You really misled me because you asked a question and I thought you had a problem. In fact, you don't have a problem. You're insulting Kevin by thinking that he's got a problem. Which means I have a problem. Which you have a serious problem. Yes, which is a is. typical one of running around making thinking it's your job to make everyone feel happy, which is attachment, Kovita. So join the universe. Hmm. I'm sorry to be shouting at everybody. You're hearing yeah, these chat. No. It's outrageous, Kovita. Be quiet. If Kevin is not clear, he'll ask his own question. Good God. This is very fascinating. It Are we all fascinating. communicating? Are we all communicating here? Yeah, that's interesting. 
Yeah. Kovita, my goodness. Well, here you have direct evidence that I am highly un enlightened so i'm very well, low I level the universe babe you meant well but as lama zopa says meaning well is not enough and as his holiness says compassion is not enough you need wisdom baby so kevin was content with the answer see he's content Convito. god in heaven somebody else come on iphone tracy wants to talk to me talk to me darling hello venerable um, my question is, I work a lot with um, special needs children yes. and adults, yes. and it just, I love them so much, it just fills Oops, I people. I Does that you, mean... I a couple of words, Tracy. Something oh, okay. Start again, sweetie. Um, so I work with special needs adults and children. Yes. And it just fills my heart. Like, I just love these guys. They are so wonderful. wonderful. Um, so I think, okay, so this is virtuous, but yeah. am I attached to them? Darling, listen, Tracy. Um, until, I think this is the thing. Until we are really highly advanced practitioners, the, the virtue that we do right now, the goodness that we do right now, of course, it's going to be mixed with attachment, sweetheart. I mean, of course it is, until we're hardly realized. You can't imagine how highly advanced you'd be if you didn't have attachment. You see, this is where these words are so simple, but the Buddhist analysis of them is much more profound, much more nuanced. It goes much deeper than the way we could even imagine it. It's almost until you've, you've given up samsara. It's almost until you realize emptiness, you're going to have attachment. So this is why, but this is where, in other words, you've got a garden full of weeds and flowers. Until you're really advanced, you're going to have some weeds there. But you, the skill is to distinguish between them, sweetheart. That's the okay. real skill. And we can't get that if you haven't studied the Buddhist model of the mind that distinguishes between attachment and the other delusions and the virtues. This is the okay. crucial point, which is not that easy. So of course there's attachment. And I tell you, let me let me tell you something. This is a good, this is a good proof that maybe if attachment is winning the day or if it's love that's winning the day. When you do something for a person you love, let's say your beloved, your husband, your child, and you are being compassionate and you do a wonderful action for them, but they chuck it back at you and they're insulting to you and they, you know, and they're mean to you. Now, if you suffer because of that, that's because you've got attachment, honey. And that's natural. We've all got it. Are you seeing my point? So if all these people were mean back to you and spat back your kindness to them and they didn't accept your kindness and they were rude to you, you would definitely suffer. Would you agree with that? No, I do. And I, I get the opposite okay. from them. Good. Good, darling. So it's quite okay. a, it's a tough one, but the fundamental point, which is my point to Kevin, which when we do study the Buddhist psychological model, and most of us don't, we need to, we've got to know theoretically first the distinction between this category called the neurotic, deluded, eye-based, fear-based states of mind, the main one of which is attachment, and the virtuous, positive, other-based, reasonable, valid states of mind. And like I keep saying, this is not the way we talk in modern psychology. It's very, very different. Okay. Are you with me, Tracy? I am. Thank you so, so much. Keep doing your wonderful actions. Keep being compassionate and then learn about your mind every second. This is the real skill, okay. sweetheart. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yes, Donna. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so, you know, it, just I have a few things. I'll try and be as quick as possible. So when you say studying the psychological model, do you mean studying the Abhidharma? No, yeah, I mean, it's, it's studying the text. It's studying the, the one, the one, it's like, it's called low rig, mind and okay. awareness. And it's basically a very technical presentation of the psychological model of the mind and the different states of mind, like I've been describing, but also the epistemological model of mind, the distinction between sensory and yeah. mental consciousness. It's very, you know, technically presented, but it's the basis for understanding our own mind. Okay. Of course, we can study it simply and we can study it more extensively. But the right. fundamental point, even just getting it here, is the point I'm making to Kevin, the point I'm making to everybody. We have to, do, it's very hard because all these states of mind are mixed together like a big soup. It's not as if 
it's not as if your herbs in your garden grow down one end and your weeds in the other end. Then it would be easy to distinguish them, wouldn't it? You see my point? It would be easy then. But the trouble is our, our delusions and our virtues literally like come together. So it's almost impossible to, to see the difference. So the only the basis for beginning to see the difference internally is first understanding the theory. The basis for you to distinguish between the weed and the herb in your garden is first understanding the theory. And that's what how we're not used to thinking in our model, in our modern model of the mind in the West. We don't think like that, you know. It's very interesting. But we're studying, talking. but studying the Abhidharma would uh, help to accomplish what you're talking about. All of yeah, oh, yes, yeah, so, because all these different texts come from those, from this vast, all these different bodies of knowledge. Absolutely, darling. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But the real one is once you've got the theories, again, like the weeds and the herbs, it can be very theoretical, then the hard work starts in applying it every day. That's the difference, you know, right. especially distinguish between love and attachment. It's almost impossible initially. Do you understand? Right. Yes, and thank you. And, and then, you know, when we when we start studying about the Mahayana path, which, yes. uh, you know, we start reading about paths and boomies and all the stages uh -huh. and states of the uh -huh. Mahayana path uh -huh. of a bodhisattva training, right? Yes. Yes. And so which we all hope to be training as bodhisattvas. Right. Yes. Um, but from recent thought on my mind, it feels like I could never achieve very much along that path. Like that, um, certainly achieving the first boomy. Uh, it just seems like who's there, you know? I mean, who's even there? I, I understand. So let's uh, just look at this carefully. So these, so do you have confidence that these teachings come from the direct experience of people who have accomplished it or not? Oh, yes. Okay, then. So then, and then <laughs> second, do you, have you ever heard the teachings on Buddha nature? That by definition, yeah. your mind, delusions are not at the core of your being and therefore can be removed. That one simple point, which is the outrageous point that Buddha has discovered, that delusions are, are not at the core of our being, that is enough to prove that in fact you can achieve it technically. So that should give you the confidence to keep moving one step at a time, Donna. Okay, and then and keeping on like study uh, or trying to live out the paramitas, right? Well, yeah, I mean, all we can do is hear the teachings and then apply them to the to the to the degree of our capability. And then those of us who want to do more study, if you want to go off and be a geshe and study 25 years in the monasteries, great, go do it. Women are even doing it now as well. If you've got that ability, go off and do it. If you want to give up sex, drugs, rock and roll, your husband, your mortgage and everything else, or you do it slowly according to where you're at in your own life. All the literature is there. All the practices are there. All we can do is go one step at a time, isn't it, surely? Yes, it just feels very slowly, that's all. I know, but I think that tells us, it, the fact that we think it's too slow indicates dissatisfaction with okay. our progress, which is okay. a function of attachment, which an attachment's never happy. Okay. All so right. we are well, understanding me. Uh, yes, thank you. You understand, Donna? Yes, I do. Good, thank you so much, darling. Very interesting, what else people? What else? Anything more from what I just said? Okay, so maybe 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Okay, so we're not going to possible to go through all these 11 techniques. Never mind. I'm just trying to give a general picture of the progress of these 11. You know, they're gradually, gradually, gradually making this paradigm shift. So why don't we just discuss briefly the, this text that's famous in Tibet and most beloved that's the most unpoetic title of all their texts. They're usually so poetic you can't believe it. And this one is called the, it's got eight verses and it's literally referred to as the eight verses. I mean, you couldn't get more, less poetic than that. So it's by Langri Tungpa, this amazing, one of these great Tibetan yogis. And it's from the teachings of this Bodhisattva path, the more advanced levels of the Bodhisattva path. And it's actually these teachings, um, these were brought first by a Atisha. To, to Tibet, he came, he's an Indian. He spent years and years with his guru Selingpa in, 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 uh, in Sumatra, part of uh, Indonesia, which is, you know, you go there, you go to this place that now the UN has, has um, fixed, what's it called? B -b Borobudur, I've been there. And it's, um, it's a, Vajrayana Buddhism flourished, you know, 1500 years ago there. 1500 years, maybe 1000 years ago. So anyway, Tisha spent years and years with Selingpa and he took all these teachings from him and, he, and he'd been, he's part of the, the Nalanda tradition, this amazing monastic university system in, uh, in India that flourished the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century until it finally 
disappeared. And um, and the tea, and the, and the, as it disappeared there, it went straight and transplanted into Tibet. And His Holiness always says we are part of the Nalanda tradition. So in other words, this Nalanda system has continued in Tibet. It died in India, but it flourished in Tibet. So many of these practices on the Bodhisattva path, especially this one that's expressed in this eight verses, it's called lojong, mind training. It's the attitude of exchanging self for others. And more, it's just one of these dramatic practices that culminates in this bodhicitta. And these teachings were kept secret in the beginning. I mean, even Milarepa said about in general, all Dharma, whatever is Dharma is the opposite of what you see. The world is, whatever's Dharma is the opposite of what you see, the opposite of the world. So this is the more advanced levels. And these were kept secret, not just Tantra. It's not Tantra, but these were kept secret. And then eventually, I think it was um, Drom Tompa, the student of Atisha, and his disciples who made these more public. And then Langri Tangpa, one of those people, I think, he wrote this little, this little baby little eight verses, simple little verses. Now, these types of verses, these types of words are, are, are not like emptiness. We're going to discuss emptiness before we finish, okay? So there we've got to squeeze our brain. We think, what are you talking about? There's no intrinsic eye. We get so confused. But these teachings, even though the words are simple, my sense is these are more outrageous. Body teacher to me is more outrageous than emptiness, more too much, too much for the human mind. I think emptiness is more manageable, I tell you. So these eight verses, let's go through them roughly. The first one, I'll just paraphrase them. The first one, so, okay, what, what are we talking here? What are these, what is the point of these verses? So clearly they are the different, indicating these different practices that you do every day, as well as in your meditation. And we're trying, what we're trying to do is where they're all based upon, okay, they're all based upon making this paradigm shift of cherishing others instead of cherishing me. So each of these eight verses gives us an ex a sort of a scenario in life where we're going to use that scenario, the suffering scenarios, the suffering scenarios, and we're going to, like the bodhisattvas, use it as grist for our mill to make this outrageous shifts in the mind, okay? So the very first one, all these words are simple. You could read them in three, in one minute and go, aren't they cute? Oh, yes, the eight verses, wow. And they're not complicated English. They're not complicated meaning. But experientially, they are insane. So what's the first one? The first, already the first line, you've got to explain it. It says, in order to get the benefit, get the most benefit from all sentient beings, not for all sentient beings. So this needs explaining. It's very confusing to us. We think it's a mistake. It says, in order to get the benefit from all sentient, from all sentient beings, I'll just describe this one first. Why they say that is this. A bodhisattva is a person who, it's like they're the best, they want to become the best doctor. They're on the way to becoming Buddha and they want, they're fierce practitioners and they want to become a doctor. And think of the analogy being a doctor, a surgeon, a doctor, let's say, a healer. And they are fiercely determined to become the best doctor as quickly as possible. Why? Because they're totally driven by this compassion. They're totally driven by this great compassion. They know it's their job. And if I don't do it, who will? So there's these fierce, determined practitioners based on incredible compassion that wants as quickly as possible to become the best doctor on the planet. Why? Because then you're qualified to help others. Doctor equals Buddha. So that's this fierce attitude that drives these bodhisattvas. So therefore you would say for them that they want to take advantage of every sentient being. They, you know, the sentient beings, the suffering sentient beings are grist for their mill. They want the worst scenarios. They won't just dispense a band-aid every now and again and then close their door at five o'clock. They're going to go off to join the Doctors Without Frontiers. You know, they're going to go off and Doctors Without Borders. They're going to go to the war zones. They're going to go into the tents in the war zone where people are missing legs and screaming in agony and this is what they want most so they're going to in order to to take to get the benefit to take advantage from all these suffering sentient beings they're grist for your mill you need these sentient beings you a bodhisattva needs suffering sentient beings if you want to be a good healer you don't just sit there and you know you you want the worst suffering possible because then you can test yourself to the limit and by doing that work you become the doctor as quickly as possible 
and it's driven by compassion. So the, that's the first line. In order to get the most benefit from, from all sentient beings, the next line, who are more precious to me than a wish-fulfilling jewel. Well, who's heard of a wish-fulfilling jewel? It used to exist eons ago. Forget it. So how about saying, who are more precious to me than a million dollars? Please hear these words. Please carefully hear these words. Who on this planet would think that one suffering dog, one suffering ant is more precious to them than a million dollars if you had this choice? I mean, it's like a demented. It's a demented idea. But that's the level of compassion of these, of these body sattvas. That that one suffering ant is far more precious to them than a pathetic million dollars. Think, I mean, this is already, this is the first verse and they used to get heavier. I can't handle these eight verses, I tell you. It's ridiculous. There's no, there's no reference point in our world for such a demented idea. You know? So therefore I will take, I will, I will hold them most dear at all times. I mean, these words are too, too much. That's verse one. Verse two, I always joke and say, if your therapist recommended this practice to you, you could sue them for abuse. The second verse says, when you are with others, see yourself as the lowest of all. But more than that, and see all others as supreme. So what in the name of God does that mean, you know? This is not possible to understand. If we, and this is the thing, Pabonka Rinpoche says, this level of practice, this lojong, this trans, you know, exchanging self for others, this level of, this outrageous level of practices that accomplish, that culminate in bodhicitta. He says, you've got to be, this is why they've kept secret. You've got to be a suitable vessel. And what's a suitable vessel? We're talking high advanced physics here. A suitable vessel is a person who's gone to college, has been to high school and has done junior school. So a suitable vessel here is a person who's accomplished some degree of renunciation, who understands suffering and its causes, who's sick of suffering and knows about karma and their own delusions, who's taking responsibility, who's got some semblance of love and compassion for others. So these teachings are too much, you know. You've got to be a suitable vessel. So what's it mean? How does this play out? How does this practice help? What are you trying to accomplish here? Well, given that you're, you're trying to become a Buddha as quickly as possible, and that you, this is the, the compassion side, you're trying to, your, your enemy, the thing that prevents you from becoming a Buddha, very simple, is two things. One is the assumption of the intrinsic I, and that's, that's attacked by realizing emptiness. And the other is, as a consequence of that, the putting of the I first. The only reason you put the I first is because this is the assumption of the I in the first place. So at, emptiness attacks the assumption of the I, and that's what we're going to discuss in a minute. And then bodhicitta and this outrageous great compassion, this is what attacks putting the I first. So here, on these, in these verses, until the last one, we're using the bodhisattva aspect, the compassion side, the compassion wing, to smash the self-cherishing, to smash the putting of I first, which is primordially instinctive because we assume there is an I in the first place, an I, a separate I, an intrinsic I. Therefore, every time you're with others, and I mean, this is asked too much. It's so broad when you're with others, you know, see yourself as the lowest of all. How about how do you practice that in daily life? Let's keep it simple. Well, you, when you think and just, it's your personal practice. So forget about being with others, just think it. Especially think right this second of someone you know, especially if you don't like them, if they've been mean to you. Think of that person right now. And now this is how to practice it. You think of one thing that that person can do better than you. I mean, maybe they've got cuter ears. Maybe they've got a prettier voice. Maybe they can do better math. Maybe their feet are nicer. Keep it really simple and humble. Something about another person that's better than that quality in you. That's this practice. Seeing yourself as 
they as supreme, but we don't like these words. In our psychology, there's no place for these kind of words. It's very strange for us. So we've really got to unpack these concepts because when we say, see yourself as the lowest of all, which sounds so extreme, we will say, excuse me, mate, I already do that. What are you trying to do? Rub my nose in it? Because our assumption now is we are creeps because we have ego grasping and we have attachment to that I, and therefore we love to hate ourselves. This is the irony of ego. So we already said so this is why we're not, if we can't hear this advice, it's because we're not a suitable vessel. This practice is too advanced for you, so don't go there. But if you can, if you can hear the logic of it, if you want to smash the, the, this, the clinging to I, you think of that person, one person at home, one person at work, your sister, somebody, think of something about them that's better than you, you know, and that's only, and that can come gradually. It's very hard for us because we feel threatened. If we've got low self-esteem, which means we haven't worked on our mind yet, we're going to, we see somebody else who's better than us. We are completely offended by it. We're completely attacked by it. We take it personally, you know, so immediately we put ourselves as lowest of all. That's not the meaning here. It's the opposite. So the person who can, the only person who can happily delight in another quality of a person and see that they're better than you at it is a person who's comfortable in who they are. And that person is a person who's done the wisdom wing, who's worked on their mind. So these teachings, these practices are outrageous, you know. And the words are so heavy. We don't use words like this in our culture to see them as superior to me. That's horrific to us. I mean, it means delighting in someone else's quality and realizing, yeah, you know, in other words, you think of a person who's got, this is very interesting about pride. We don't like to think we've got pride, but if you've got low self-esteem, honey, children, you have got pride because low self-esteem is the flip side of pride. Again, all the functional, like we're talking to, you know, Kevin before, the key characteristic of delusions, of afflictions, the key characteristic is that they exaggerate. So attachment exaggerates the deliciousness of your new girlfriend. Attachment exaggerates the deliciousness of chocolate cake. Aversion, anger, exaggerates the ugliness of the cake, the ugliness of the ex-girlfriend who cheated on you. <coughs> so therefore, pride is an over-exaggeration of your good qualities. Low self-esteem, which is deflated pride, when you meet someone else who's better than you, is an over-exaggeration of your bad qualities. And we go between these two extremes all the time. Whereas virtuous states of mind are valid. Virtuous states of mind are reasonable. <coughs> so a virtuous state of mind would be one that then you see someone who's, who's better at math than you. If you've got pride, you'd be offended by that. You'd be insulted and hurt by that. And then you get low self-esteem. But if you've got virtuous state of mind, you'd have humility, which means, wow, I really admire. They are fantastic. Well done. And then, and that's coming from humility, not low self-esteem. So again, always comes down to this distinction, like I said to Kevin, between the characteristics of the virtues and the non-virtues. They are fundamentally different, you know. So delighting in another person, in their qualities, and seeing them as better than you is a healthy, amazing, wonderful quality. But if it's coming from the wrong place, it is a nightmare. And that's what we're doing all the time. A person who's got low self-esteem sees the whole world as better than them, but they're like offended by it. They're insulted by it. Because why? Because they'd rather be better. This is so unhealthy. And it, this is how we feel in our culture, you know. The third verse says something like, it seems to be a bit, slightly different from the rest. It's more to do with just your own mind now. If you, the moment you see a delusion, you're going to grab it and avert it because it's going to harm you and others. I mean, this sense too much, you know, the assumption already here is that your mind is, you know, the, the, the default mode in your mind is virtuous states of mind. And as soon as you catch a naughty little delusion, you catch it and grab it. Well, for us, the default mode is the delusions, attachment, fears, dramas, expectations, low self-esteem, you know, so this is pretty subtle. This demand already shows I've got some concentration. It's an advanced practice, really. Now, the next three, uh, each one gets worse than the other. And my sense is the scenarios of these three. So the first, the next one, one, two, three, fourth verse, third verse. Yeah, the third, third verse. Yeah, third verse, okay? 
This is sort of like the world out there. And it's something like this. When you see the wackos, this is not the words they use, and this is like 10th century Tibet. I'm using 21st century American. When you look out in the world, you see the wackos, you see the psychopaths, you see the murderers, the terrorists, the crazies, the, the mad politicians, the harmers, the evil ones who are, who are causing themselves unbelievable suffering and harming others. What is the attitude you're trying to cultivate? I forget now the attitude, the three different attitudes you've got to cultivate from these three scenarios. So this scenario, you see these wackos, you're going to have, you're going to see them as, I have to look it up, I'm sorry, there's very specific three attitudes, eight verses, hang on a second, I forget. Eight verses, here we go. So the first one is, this, this one, third verse, verse one, verse two, verse three, okay, you're going to, verse four, this is verse four, yeah four five six that's right you're going to act as if you found a precious treasure now i didn't misspeak okay i'll say it again this is the way they use the words in the verse but i'll put them in my words whenever you see beings who are wicked in nature i mean who speaks like that anymore we don't unless you go to broadway and see a movie that play about the wicked one or something so yeah, wicked in nature, who is overwhelmed by violent negative actions and suffering. We call them psychopaths, okay? Now, what's the, so think of this, what's the normal view? Horror, shock, outrage, how dare they? They're evil, they should go to hell for eternity, put them on death row forever, they're horrible, and we have a panic attack. That's the usual view. The view here is you will act as if you found a precious treasure. Now, what the hell for? What does it mean precisely? So again, remember the point of all these verses. You're, you want the, basically you're a brave bodhisattva who wants the worst scenarios possible because those will trigger ego, will trigger aversion. And you want to turn that around and use it to have unbelievable compassion. So this is the object of your, this is the object of your aversion the object of your horror, but for whom you will have unbelievable compassion. So you've got this precious treasure. Now, of course, back in 10th century Tibet, I don't think you'd find too many of them, but we are flooded. Are we not in this crazy world we live in now? Flooded by suffering psychopaths. It's, the, it's, it's just the world, it's called samsara. So you can only have compassion for them if you've understood in the junior school, control your body and speech, you've understood karma, you've understood your mind, and you understood delusions, and you understand that that's what they cause you suffering. So karma and delusions. And then you see the outside world, and you see the psychopaths driven by their own insane past, driven by their delusions, driven by their crazy karmic tendencies, and they harm themselves and they harm others. That is the precious treasure you have found. You know, This is outrageous stuff. Your mind's got to be ready for this. The next one gets worse. It's closer to home now. It's closer to home now, my sense is. This next one, basically saying the person at work who accuses you of lying or stealing and who's talking about you behind backs or you're getting thrown out of home or people accusing you of doing a wrong thing. We get that one. This is such a common experience for everybody. There's everybody in this room now has had someone accuse them of something they didn't do, abuse them when they were innocent. This is just the commonest way we suffer. So how are you going to feel about them? You'll accept the defeat and offer the victory to them. I mean, we don't even like accepting defeat when we've done the wrong thing. But this is when you haven't done anything wrong. You will accept the defeat and offer the victory to them. This is demented for us, you know. So again, you've got to be a suitable vessel. I'm sorry. You're not going to be this victim who is a doormat and sits there and allows your abusive drunken husband to abuse you daily. That's not this practice. That's the practice of a person who's a victim, who's got no practice, who's not aware, who's got so much attachment and craving and, and has no power in their own mind whatsoever. This is an outrageous practice. Accept the blame. Accept the blame. You're right. I did it. Even if that person thinks you broke the cup. Yeah, you're right. I'm so sorry. I mean, look at the instinct that screams and defends ourselves. Outrage, the pain. Not to mention the really serious suffering, like being on death row and you're accused of murder when you didn't do it. People lose their minds completely. This is an insane practice. You've got to be a suitable vessel. And why are you doing it? Not to be a doormat, to smash 
ego grasping and smash self-cherishing, which are the enemies which are preventing you from becoming this best Buddha. You've got to understand the logic of them, you know. If you don't understand the logic, then leave these verses alone. Don't say them. Leave them there. The next one's even worse. It's close to home right now. Your beloved, your beloved child, your beloved partner. When someone whom I've benefited and to whom I have great in whom I have great hopes, your beloved child, your beloved partner, they give you terrible harm. They reject you. They blame you. They throw you out. I will, I will act, I will see them as my precious guru. These are intense. These are too, too much. No wonder they were kept secret. But you've got to understand where they're coming from. You've got to understand contextually. You've got to understand, you know, the, 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 the basis first. And you've got to understand what the reason behind it. Because we hear this, we would, we would. I mean, I swear, like I said, I'm not joking. If you, if you don't understand where this is coming from and your therapist tells you to do this, you can accuse them of abuse. And you would be valid in doing that in our world. You've got to be a suitable vessel. Ask some questions now. Please, I need you to ask me some questions. This is the essence of this entire compassion wing, you know, this is the essence of it. The most radical level of practice. So any questions, please? And we'll talk about emptiness. Hi, Venerable Rabina. Yes. Yes, Joanne. Darling. Long time no see. Hello, sweetheart. I'm happy to see Hello, you. Lady, I hope you. I Where are you? You're in Texas. Aren't you in Texas? You're in Texas. No, right? I'm in Spokane, Washington now. I moved. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Good, Joanne. Talk to me, darling. So I'm just reflecting on uh, what you're laying out, and I, if you're free of, oh, sorry, I've got some interference here. If you're free of self grasping, um, you could actually be joyful about your own strengths. And that's right precisely that's the whole point here that's exactly right joanne as you're doing the wisdom wing and you're lessening your own neurosis what you're becoming is way more courageous way more brave way more content and therefore easily able to see the suffering of others and do things like this yes that's exactly the point yes okay that was the person the only person who can who can take the blame is a person who's got incredible confidence incredible self-confidence incredible contentment in who they are which is the culmination of the wisdom wing if you're fragile and suffering and are not aware of your mind and full of self-pity and self-loathing this is not your practice this is a fact it's so clear isn't it joanne so good to see you thank you Good, yes. In other words, if you're not at this level, anybody, then your job is not to do this. Your job is to stand up for your rights. If you're used to being the victim and the doormat, your job is to say, excuse me, I didn't do it and have the courage to stand up for yourself. It doesn't say it like that, but that's absolutely certain. So we have to know where we're at, you know. That's why reading these things out of context, you can totally misunderstand them. Totally misunderstand them, you know. It's so important to see them as contextual. Anybody else, please? Any questions? Okay. Rapina? Yes, darling. Yes, Sasha. Hi. Um, so when, do you know when, <clears throat> when you need to stand up for your rights to not be a victim and a doormat and to yes. not have people in your life who've been repeatedly yes. mean or abusive? Yes. <clears throat> yes. When do you know, where's the... Yes. I think the, the only answer, Sasha, is sort of like, when do you know when you can distinguish between a word and a he, a, a he, a herb and a weed? I'm not being easy. It's true. If you don't know botany, if you haven't applied it, when you go to the garden and you can't distinguish it, then you know that you can't. So when you know you can, it's because you've studied it and understood it and done the inner work. So the broader answer is, this is really based upon knowing your mind really well knowing our mind well and learning to distinguish in our own mind from our daily practice the difference between attachment to being loved and to want others to be happy which is called love the attachment the way and also it has to factor in karma sasha i mean we don't think of that of course in our culture 
But if you've got some really strong connection with some, let's say, a person in your life, let's just say it's your hubby or somebody, I have no idea, this is talking, use an example, let's just pretend. But, you know, you've got some strong karma with that person in the first place, why they're even in your life. I mean, why, and they seem to be stuck in your life and you don't seem to be able to escape from them. This is the past karma, very heavy with that very specific person or particular child or a person in a job. You've got strong karma. It's like you're in this boat together, you know, and that's past karma. And then due to your own past karma, you've got this person now in your life abusing you or harming you. Then that's already pretty heavy. When you understand karma, it helps you understand why you've got this person. And then the work is to work on your own mind and to purify that karma and to learn to see your own mind well and learn to distinguish, to know when to be brave, when at some point you're going to say, okay, excuse me, I'm out of here. That's a powerful point, but it can only come from the internal work every day looking and watching and practicing you understand Sasha yeah I think so and uh, <laughs> we've got to be brave we've got to risk it sometimes I mean usually if we're in a relationship because I mean all relationships if you think about it, it's just a western way of talking there's always a power dynamic isn't there we feel everybody a person in the party a person at home a person at work we always feel in reference to the other person, if we're the lower or the higher, we're always using your kind of the delusions are running kind of crazy. So if you're always feeling in your own life, I'm not saying you personally, but anybody that we're always on the underdog, we're always the one who's kind of quiet and soft, and we get used by others. It's very painful. It's extremely painful. So we've got to learn to know that this is a learning about my mind. I've got to know about my mind and I've got to slowly grow myself and my good qualities and my contentment. And as ma even if a thousand people a day tell me I'm a lovely person, I've got to start saying that to myself. And this grows slowly, slowly. And then we can gradually have the courage to extricate ourselves from relationships, from bad yeah. relationships. Yeah, I mean, I our problem is what, darling? Say it again. Yeah, I've recently extricated myself from a couple of relationships. Well, well done, Sasha. That's a good long, move. Long-term friendships. And it's um, when I listened to you, I was thinking, yeah. oh, well, you know, there are opportunities to cut my ego and maybe no, I shouldn't have been no, nothing wrong. No, Sasha, it's excellent. But in the re and that's where the in this first stage is a practice to really know to know when the time is to go. Part of our problem is we're so scared of what other people think. We're scared of a bad reputation that keeps us paralyzed in these relationships. So to have the courage to know this is not healthy and this is where I'm at and it's good to leave, that's very courageous, Sasha. And then at another time later on, as we're more advanced, you might do the other practice as well. You might just accept the blame. You might just accept it. But you know- Well, I, I and, did that. I did that most, most of my life, that first- That was in the <laughs> negative way though, wasn't it? The unhealthy way, wasn't it? Yes, yes. You allowed yourself to be a doormat, right? Right, I was taught that's to do And that's that. the irony is you've got to realize, Sasha, that that's coming from attachment to you being a good girl because you're obviously a good girl, right? And I mean that in a nice way. But that can be attachment to being seen as a good girl, which paralyzes you. But now you're getting some courage. Well done, Sasha. Thank you, Mabina. Thank good. you. Good, darling. So this is why we've got to know the difference, you people. We've got to know, and the, the key to it is knowing our own mind. There's no shortcut. You can read 4,000 books on this stuff. You've got to do the inner work, you know, and then slowly have the courage. And also risk it. You might make the wrong decision sometimes. You might leave the job when you think, okay, I shouldn't have. It's okay. We're, we're human. Be brave. Take risks, you know, but always have the right motivation. That's where intentional motivation comes in. If you left the relationship, Sasha, because you think they're creeps, then that's the wrong reason. You leave the relationship because you know it's not healthy and it's not the right place for you. That's a good motivation. You know, it's got to be, that's where intention for sure comes, Kevin. Motivation is huge. What else, people? Any other points? Okay, so this eventually then, let's just go. These are the general views, the attitudes, okay? So this next one, this is verse seven, this is where that meditation called Tong Len comes from. In short, both directly and indirectly, do I offer every happiness and benefit to all my mothers? And then I will secretly take upon myself all their harmful actions and suffering. So broadly, this is a powerful attitude that's now kind of expressed in this meditation that's called Tong Len, giving, taking. So the first two lines, the attitude of wanting to give all your things, all your virtue, all your merit and all your happiness to others and to take 
upon yourself their suffering. This is the culmination of all this. And this is the essence of the whole body such a path, you know. And this is the practice that is the basis that then t finally brings that paradigm shift called bodhicitta. Some, it's interesting that people in the West love this practice. I, 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 I'm fascinated. It's so intense. So essentially, as a meditation, how would you do it? Well, you know, you start, I mean, people do years of retreat just on this technique. So you would start with, say, your beloved, your best friend, she's got a headache. So you'd visualize your beloved with a headache. So then what you do is you use your breath. So you'd visualize, let's say, there's many ways of doing this. And it's just a view, but you can have it every second of the day, but you can do it as a meditation. So you're visualizing, imagining your at your heart, like a rock. That's your self-cherishing. It's your self-centeredness. It's your putting me first. It's your, you know, um, what we call in the West, selfishness. They call it self-cherishing. So you have your little rock at the heart, your self-centeredness, and then you visualize. First of all, you breathe in, and you. this is the taking part. You, you imagine breathing in like yucky smoke, your beloved's headache. So the thing is here, this is not a healing technique for your beloved with a headache. This is not so that you get a headache. That's like a joke. It's not either of those. It's you using the visualization of your beloved with a headache as a means for you to develop the courage that if you could, you would rather have the headache than them. It's you practicing. There are lots of healing techniques. This is not a healing technique. This is a method for you to think if you could, you would have the headache rather than them. Mummies and daddies have this for their babies who are sick. I wish I could have it instead, they say. That's exactly what this is. My friend in prison, my, my crazy friend, Richie, I've known for 25 years, an ex-Mexican, an ex-gangster. He's not ex-Mexican, he is Mexican, but he's an ex-gangster. And I only, he wrote to me and he said, because he's, he's in prison for killing, being on, you know, in the gangs in the streets of Los Angeles. Actually, he very first wrote to me. I remember he very first wrote to me. He was back in 96 or something when we first started the project. And he was in this top security section of this prison called Pelican Bay in California that's kind of famous for starting, which is now common in the States, this permanent lockdown scenario is where people are in their cells 23 hours a day, you know. So he was there and he, he met one of another person who'd written to us and he wrote and he, and he started to practice Tara. He liked the practice of Tara. And he told me all about his anger in his letter. He's very angry. He said, but I'm very laid back. When I get angry, I get really angry. You know, so, you know, he's, he's heavy duty. So anyway, I went to meet him eventually. He drove up there eight hours from Santa Cruz and he was up right on the north. It's right on the border of Oregon on the corner, on the corner of, on the West Coast, you know. And uh, I drove up there eight hours and had this two hour meeting with him with the phone and the glass between us, you know. So there he was covered in his tattoos, which is all his prison. They all tell me it's prison art, covered in his tats. So he, there he was. And I, anyway, I, uh, I said, how's your anger, Richie? And he kind of blushed under his tattoos. And he said, Rabina, I'm sorry, but I had a fight with my celly this morning, his cellmate, his celly. And I put his head down the toilet. But then he said, and very innocent, he said, but Rabina, I took it out again. In other words, he didn't kill a fourth person. And I thought, wow, you know, that's practice. So he had the guy chucked out, he told me, and then he did his Tara meditation because he loves Tara, you know. That's when I first met him. Anyway, he's still there in prison, he's in for life. And one time he wrote and he said he had AIDS or he had the, vi not the virus, but what, what, whatever, whatever, I forget, I don't know what it was. So he's getting medicine and he said to, and then he said to me, well, Bina, maybe I should, um, maybe it's better for me not to have the medicine and to get sick and to die and then try and imagine, you know, taking on the suffering of all my people and purifying. I mean, I was so moved by that, you know, unbelievable. This dude has killed people on the streets of Los Angeles. And then he said, and I see my young, I see our young, I see our people, his, our, his people, his Mexicans, you know, my, the young guys coming in. He said, I wish I could, I wish I could take on their sentence and they could be released, you know. I mean, that's Tong Len. That's outrageous. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You have to sit on your cushion to do it. You can see a homeless person, and maybe you're not ready to actually do it, to go over there and give them your home keys and give them your car and swap clothing and sit on their cushion and give them everything of yours. You're not ready to take up on their suffering and give them happiness, but you can think it. 
I mean, just thinking these things is like atomic bombs on delusions and self-centeredness. So don't make it all high and think you have to be on your cushion to do this. You know, you see a dog suffering and, you know, you got, and you just think, I wish I could have that suffering instead of the dog. I mean, you, you, you feel safe to say it, but it's unbelievably powerful instead of like, oh, my God, thank God I'm not suffering, which is how we tend to see it now. You have this hubris of seeing all these poor people and the suffering people and the homeless people and the terror and the crazy people. Thank God it's not me, we'll say, you know, we'll just swap it around. So I'd rather have that. I wish I could take on the suffering and me have it. So you take upon yourself their suffering. And then the second one, you breathe out blissful light and you give them your happiness, your health. It's an easy thought to have and it's outrageous. It's unbelievable. It's like the culmination of all these practices. Just to remember to do it. It's incredible, unbelievable. So when you do it seriously, and you, I mean, people, these yogis spend years in retreat doing this with all the realms of existence. And then finally the shift comes and they become bodhisattva. They, be, they achieve this bodhicitta, this paradigm shift, you know. So I always tell, I love to tell this story. Um, some of you might have heard it. My friend Harry, right now, he, him and his partner, Mary, they're in retreat just north of me, Colorado. I'm in Santa Fe. Where, how far away from you am I? In, how far is it to... Uh, San Antonio. 12 hour drive. Oh, not too bad. I'll okay. come one day. Yeah, okay, you should. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll come for a weekend. Please into, do. Into, into COVID 19 ridden Texas. I mean, Australia, they're so strict. They've got about four new cases and they closed the whole damn city down, you know. I mean, Australia is so different. They're getting fed up with being closed down all the time, but they're almost having no deaths at all. But they keep closing things down because the new variant has come, isn't it? You know, whatever. So the thing is, anyway, Harry's up north there. He's lived for years in caves up in Nepal. He's in the, both of them, both of them, amazing. So years and years and years ago, this story happened. People always talk about Harry. He's an American fellow. He used to be a monk and now he's not. He looks like Santa Claus. He's got a very fat, maybe he's thin now. I don't know. He keeps saying he'd go on a diet <coughs> with a big beard. You know, he looks like Santa Claus, Father Christmas, as we say in Australia. Anyway, everyone will always say, oh, Harry's a bodhisattva. Harry's a bodhisattva. And I think, well, I don't know. He's a bodhisattva. He's a nice guy. Everyone loves him. You know, he's a friendly fellow. So I heard this story and I figured, well, Harry must be a bodhisattva. And then you hear about all the retreats he's done, living up naked in the caves in Nepal, you know. So anyway, the story is this. This is maybe in the 90s, I think. 90s? Yeah, it could be 90s. Before, before mobiles, before cell phones. So anyway, he's, uh, he's at Kopan Monastery, our monastery in Kathmandu, and Lama Zopa was there. And then Geshe Lama Kontrog, one of these amazing holy beings, this holy lama who, whose biography I'm doing actually, I'm waiting to do it. He was lived in caves for years and years up in the mountains, no food, no sleep, no clothes, naked, lived in Vajrayogini's pure land, Lama Zopa says. He's an amazing holy being. So he, anyway, he was a Kopan too. So that Harry, then suddenly Lama Zopa, Harry had, was getting ready. So Harry was getting ready to pack his pack, pack his pack to go up to his cave. He's got a cave up in the mountains, Solakumbu north of where Lama Zopa has a cave from his past life. So anyway, Harry was getting ready to go up to his cave and he'd packed his bags and he'd gone. And then Lama Zopa said he had a dream that Harry would die because you walk up these mountains and they're really treacherous, I tell you. For a couple of years, we led some treks up there and when things open up again, we'll do another trek. So before you die, I recommend you come with me. They're amazing, go up to those mountains, so special. So it's uh, really treacherous walks up there, you know. And these, and there's anyway, he, um, Lama Zopa said he had a dream that Harry would die and to give him, send a message not to go, but he'd left already. And so it's before mobile. So he's left. So then Lama Zopa gave a message to Geshe Lama Kontra, this amazing yogi. He said to please pray for Harry. That's it. So anyway, I then heard the story from Harry. I'd heard about the story later from somebody, a nun who was with him. And then I got it directly from the horse's mouth or well, from Harry, Harry's mouth, not a horse. So basically the story is roughly this. He's walking up there. I don't know whether he walked the whole 10 days or whether he flew to Lukla and then you walk a few days, you know, and he had his pack on his back, his 20 kilo pack or whatever. And then suddenly, and there's this part of the walk where there's been an avalanche so that the, the path had been di diverted. So to this tiny, really treacherous little tiny path, people fall off those places regularly. You know, when we went up there one year, a yak nearly knocked me over onto the side, but I meant I got saved. It's okay. But they're quite treacherous, you know, and these porters. So suddenly he's in this really, and the porters as well. He's in this really narrow path with his pack walking up. And suddenly he sees coming down very close 
It's very intense, three porters. And these young Sherpas, they wear their flip-flops, you know. I mean, these us Westerners wear all these fancy boots with necks on them and cost four thousand dollars and special blah blah blah, you know. So they just wear their flip-flops, these guys, and they're walking down three porters, and they carry something like 60 kilos. And they they pride themselves. They they like to carry the biggest packs and they and they're bent completely. As a friend of mine who used to do it, he said, All you do is see your feet for 10 days. You bent double, you know, with this big pack on your back and around, around your forehead. So there are these three porters, totally intense, coming down this narrow path with their packs on their backs. And it's so intense, there's no time to think. And he said, the first thought that came into my mind was, three of them, one of me. Okay, I'll step to the side. So I don't even talk about that here, but in all these practices of accomplishing body teacher, of smashing self-grasping, you're using these logical arguments to, 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 to argue with ego. So we think now instinctively, I am first, you know, naturally, and then others are more. So what, and others, are, they, they come second. But, you know, you know yourself when he says one of the logics, sorry, jumping around, one of the logics you use to smash ego is, well, I'm one, two is more than one, therefore they're more important. I mean, if you had the choice of one dollar or two, I'm sorry, you'd take the two. But it's too much for our mind to think this, you know. So he said, three of them, one of me, okay, I'll step to the side. So now, but before I go further, it's think about this. Who would think that naturally? Nobody, because instinct of ego is really intense. Instinct to put me first. Maybe if they were your children, you might. But strangers, for God's sake, you know. So obviously he must have done a lot of work on his mind in his cave, not just sitting there watching his breath. So this is the proof of the pudding. This is the proof, this is the culmination. This is the proof that he's done the work that when the situation comes, he's able to easily, effortlessly, quietly, simply think three of them, one of me. So he stepped close to the edge of the cliff. Well, it's a thousand drop, a thousand foot drop, you know. Then the next second, his second thought, because it's so intense or so quick, his second thought was, if they knock me, I won't hold on. Well, they knocked him and he didn't hold on. And his feet are on the ground. His pack is pulling him. And he said, I had a psychic vision of the entire fall. I saw my body crash to the ground. Then he said, I felt the hands of Geshe Lama Konchog. And he pushed him and he reversed direction and fell into the, fell into the path, you know. So that one is, that, that seems to me the proof of the pudding, that if those thoughts arise in your mind, that can't come naturally. So obviously he's done all the practice. He's done the junior school, the high school, the university, the bodhicitta, the transforming, the tonglen, and this is the proof of the pudding. He doesn't go, look at me, I'm going to be a bodhisattva, I'm giving my life for you. It just became spontaneous. So that level of virtue, this is my way of putting it, that bodhicitta arising, putting others first before him, even the cost of his life. And then this also shows the power of the holy beings. I mean, all the teachings, if you, we need to kind of, this seems like mystical to us, but we need to read the teachings about bodhicitta, read the paths, read all the stages of development, read the qualities of what you accomplish when you've accomplished. So clearly, I mean, Geshe Lama Kontra, Lama Zopa said he lived in Vajra Yogini's pure land. He lived, he was a highly evolved being, lived in these caves for years and years, you know. And then he was at Kopan looking like an old grumpy, grumpy old grandpa. He didn't know what he knew he was a yogi. He looked like a grumpy old grandpa, you know scare the life out of you. He was a holy being. So he's able, the lowest level body suffers of the 10 boomies, you know, that Donna mentioned, the lowest level body suffer on the first of the 10 boomies, once you realize emptiness, you're an Arya Bodhisattva, the lowest level of the Bodhisattvas can already manifest their mind in 100 different bodies simultaneously for the benefit of others. So Bodhisattvas aren't just nice people. You can't imagine their power. And all this, the logic of all this is in the teachings. It sounds like mystical to us. It sounds, in fact, insane to think you can manifest even one body. This is the lowest level body sattva. Manifesting spontaneously wherever you're needed to benefit sentient beings. So I like that story. We're late now, but I think we have to talk about emptiness, the final stages of the body sattva path, isn't it? Shall I continue, Kovita, or shall we stop now? We're late. Please, Venerable, if I would love if you would continue. We're recording, and if people need to leave, they can 
circle back and watch the recording. Well, I mean, we haven't, so we've got bodhicitta now, and then we then we go through the next stages where we practice from life after life after life, bopping around from sentient being to sentient being, from life to life, benefiting others. So the first four are the perfection of the compassion wing, and there's no time to go into those. The last, maybe I'll mention the last one, then we'll discuss emptiness briefly. The last of these four, the most important is called enthusiasm, joyful effort. Because what you're doing from life after life isn't just going around being a nice person. You're going around becoming a Buddha, doing the job that's necessary. So the fourth one is the most important, they say, and that's called enthusiasm, joyful effort. So what's that? Without this, you won't be successful. The opposite is called laziness, and it's very, it puts it right in focus when we understand it in terms of the opposite. So the opposite is laziness, and we all recognize this in our own lives, you know. The first kind of laziness is can't be bothered. So I analyze this. What is the thing we can't be bothered doing? Is the thing that takes effort. And what takes effort is what attachment doesn't want. Because you see, the, the, main, the, main, the main obstacle, the primordial obstacle for our making effort, to our making effort is attachment to our, and what too, not just sex and drugs and rock and roll, attachment to our comfort zone. Think of it. We spend our lives, if you were so fortunate to have a good life, when you haven't have to deal with the real big dramas, you know, I mean, I'm just attached to comfort. I've got a nice house. I bought nice things. I've got a nice bed. I've got nice this and nice that and good food and a nice stove and a nice fridge. And so everything we do is normally in our daily life is maintain our comfort zone. Not have to, I'm having to deal with dramas. I don't have any insects coming in here. It's very dry here. Not many insects. I don't have any rats coming in or rapists or murderers or dramas or big pains in my knee. Nothing like this. Just everything is to maintain your comfort zone. So the thing you don't want to do is the thing that takes effort. And the thing that takes effort is the thing that attachment doesn't want because your attachment is a junkie to be comfortable. This is the grossest level of, of laziness. So the next one, they tend to put these two together. But I think it's a crucial one to point out. The next one is, I'm too busy. And what is the thing you too, what, this is called pro procrastination. This is our worst crime, I tell you. And what is the thing you put off doing? What is the thing you think you're too busy to do? Is the thing that attachment doesn't want because it takes effort. But the, you added a lie to it. You added this to make it like virtue, you know. It sounds, oh, no, I'm too busy. I can't do that. I've got to go this. I've got to go here. I've got to go there. So then this is a lie. It's a lie. We adorn the first one with this lie that makes us feel virtuous. We will see the job to be done. And within a millisecond, you're saying, oh, I'm too busy. I'll do it later. It's a lie. Later never comes. We know this. They all, the lamas often say that the most painful way to die is to die with the regret of not having done the things you wanted to do. Of course, we're talking virtuous things here. I remember reading years ago, an Australian nurse who lived in England, she wrote a book about, she used to do a blog, and then she wrote a book called The Five Greatest Regrets of the Dying. And the greatest regret was that I didn't follow my heart. I didn't do what I really knew. I, um, we're talking a virtue here, okay? Not wanting to kill seven people. I didn't do what I knew I wanted to do, what was the best thing. Instead, I did what I thought other people expected of me. This is what holds us back. This is the point we're discussing with, um, you know, uh, Shasta. Was it Shasta? Where are you, darling? Shasta, Sasha having the courage, in spite of what people think, to go ahead and do what you really want, to do the right, I mean, I'm talking about doing the virtuous thing, the right thing, being brave. If that job is no good, you leave it. If that relationship is holding you back, you leave it. But we're talking here, of course, the level of practice of wanting to become a Buddha. This is the worst one. I'm too busy, I'll do it later. And the thing you're too busy to do is the thing that you can't be bothered doing, which is what attachment doesn't want. And we lie to ourselves. This is our, one of our wickedest things against ourselves, you know. And then we carry this burden all our lives and what we, we want to do, but we haven't done and we'll do it later. Before you know it, you're dead. The third one, the worst one, 
the deepest mistake, the one that finally holds us back, is the laziness of thinking, no, I can't do that. I can't accomplish that. No, that's not possible. I can't do that. That's too difficult. I can't do that. I and mean, that sounds like a virtue as well. But these are what hold us back. These, And the opposite of these is the courage to not go, is to go against the laziness, attachment one step at a time, to, go, to not procrastinate and to know it is true, I can do it. But one step at a time, it's incremental. Rome wasn't built in a day. Everything starts with the first step. We have all these wonderful sayings. It's dependent arising, one step at a time. That's the crucial one of those four. So then we now look at the second, the last two of the six perfections, which are where you perfect the wisdom wing. The first one is concentration meditation. And the reason you need that is so that you can use it for the sixth one, which is finally getting insight into the root delusion, the, the, the belief in the intrinsic me, which is the cause of all suffering and all samsara and all self-cherishing in the first place. So we need to realize emptiness in the subtlety of concentration meditation. So we'll just discuss that for a few minutes. So we're preparing for this. This entire path up to now is preparing us. Obviously, any, any you know, when you get to physics, when you get to university physics, it's obvious that your high school and your junior school have prepared you for it. It's gradual, it's incremental, isn't it? So everything we've been doing on the mind and the body and the speech until now, including the body tutor, are preparing our mind, preparing our mind for getting concentration meditation, getting shamatha, so that we can realize emptiness. So let's look at emptiness very briefly in the context of dependent arising. It's a king of logics, as Nami Yeshi puts it, to prove emptiness, which is paraphrasing Tsongkhapa. And he praises the Buddha for his amazing teachings on dependent arising. So everything that exists, the Buddha says, everything that exists, everything that exists, necessarily lacks intrinsic an intrinsic nature. So when we hear those words, we go, lacks an intrinsic nature. We go, huh? What are you talking about? What does that mean? Because why? Because Buddha's telling us that the job of the root delusion, ego grasping, is known colloquially as ego grasping. Its term, its name is ignorance, mahrigpa. And it's, when, it, when it relates to the I, we can call it ego grasping. It's this primordial instinctive, primordially deep belief that there is in here somewhere a real, solid, definite, pointable, findable me. And, and that's where he diverged from the Hindus. They gave up the grossest level of suffering. They gave up the second level of suffering, but they didn't find a method to get rid of this one. And that's where he, he diverged from the Hindus, the Buddhist view would say. And the only way we can get this realization finally is in subtle concentration, which we get from getting shamatha, single point of concentration, which doesn't mean we can't do work initially. We can do the work intellectually. We're talking about it right now. We can do that. We need to do that. But this is the source of all suffering, the root of all suffering. So, okay. So let's just talk about it briefly. We'll see this ultimate truth that everything lacks this intrinsic nature in the framework of conventional truth. These are the two truths they talk about, conventional and ultimate. Everything that exists, exists in these two ways. So dependent arising is the shorthand for how things exist conventionally. And emptiness is the shorthand for, how th for the ultimate nature of things. So clearly all this language You've got to get used to it, you know, because it's a foreign language to us. We haven't, we don't speak like this. So, okay, there are three levels at which Buddha taught that things have, that the I exists interdependently. Everything exists like this, but we're going to use the object called I. The word object, existent, object of knowledge, phenomenon, established base, these are all synonyms 
for that which exists. And Buddha's deal is that we are not, are not in sync with how things exist. And the reason is because of all the delusions that blind us from seeing how things exist. Ultimately, finally. So um, the three main arguments Buddha used roughly uh, with the previous, the prevailing views. One is that, the, that he argued with how there is no I that isn't the product of causes. He's arguing one of the prevailing views at the time. And so a perfect example of this is the, as the law of karma. The law of cause and effect is a marvelous argument against this instinctive view. And we learned about that in junior school. That I am the product of countless causes. Second argument, we'll discuss that one now. The second one, the more subtle argument, is that there is no I separate from the parts, the bits and pieces that make up the I. So this is arguing very obviously with one of those two main views here what is arguing with the view, the belief, the instinctive belief that there is here, in here, somewhere. A very special part that's called me, I, self. We believe this utterly and completely. That's one mistake and we can discuss this one. So Buddha is basically saying there isn't a part in here, as my friend Pende says, walking hand in hand with all the other parts. There is not a particular part called I that walks hand in hand with the other parts called nose, ear, love, hate, good, bad, knee, toe, all the other millions of parts. So I is made of millions of parts. But we instinctively believe without question that there is a part in there, a very special one, like a boss part that's called I, like the puppeteer, the one who runs the show. And that's how we talk. So we have to prove logically how there isn't that I. And Buddha says, if you won't find one, and in fact, you don't need one. It's, 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 it's extra. It's an extra bell and whistle that we have added. So there's a more subtle, even more subtle level of emptiness, dependent arising, that comes as a result of working on this one. So we'll stick to this one for now. So there's a multitude of ways we have to use logic to argue with the view of ego grasping that believes that there is that I in here somewhere. So one of the things the Buddha says we've got to do is we've got to search for it, which sounds hilarious. He says, well, if you believe something's there, you've got to search for it and point it out to me and show me. There it is. Look, when you're wrong, Buddha. So he says, I'm happy to be wrong. Show me where this eye is, please. It sounds hilarious to us. So I like to use, some of you might have heard this, but I like to use the example of Ikea. It's a very good example, actually. So let's say, you know, you decide you're going to go buy one me at Ikea. You look up online, there's a nice looking Covita. And you think, I'll go buy a Covita, okay? So, you know, you get a bit disappointed initially because you're going to go and get a bloody box full of a million parts, isn't it? We've got to make, we've got to build our own Covita, isn't it? It's a good example, actually. So you're going to get your box of Covita. You're going to looking forward to building the Covita. Got the vision of exactly what she looked like. So you know you've got to find all the parts. Now, first of all, you know that clever IKEA, the designers, have already built a Covita and they know all the parts. So they've chucked all the parts into one nice box. So they haven't given you the sort of four and a half legs and three fingers and cross their fingers. They've been very precise. They've given you the exact number of things that make up Covita. So there's the, all the parts of her body and there are all the parts of her mind. So you're gradually putting together this Covita and you're convinced that something you keep sort of behind in behind in your mind as you put them all together, the finger, the this and the, the brain and the that and the thing and the atoms and the pee, pee and the caca and the blood, whatever's there, you're gradually building this Covita. This is doing the you normally got to do the other way around. We normally do the deconstruction of all the parts. We're doing the building of the parts here. It's the other way around, but it's very helpful. 
So you're convinced in the back of your mind that slowly you're going to be uncovering the very special part because each part has its own little packet. There's, it says, you know, one finger, one little finger, one big finger, one index, one moment of anger, all the bits and pieces. You're putting them together, but we're convinced we're going to suddenly find the piece that's called I, the special one, without which we think Kavita won't work. But as you keep putting together all the parts, you're going to find you won't find any piece that's called Kavita. They you and you'll think, well, they must have missed it out. Where you ring up IKEA really upset. Where's the eye? Honey, they'll say you don't need one. You know why? Because the parts do fine on their own, functioning as Kavita. But we've added an extra bell and whistle, and we believed in that extra bell and whistle for eons upon eons upon eons. But it has never, doesn't, and could never exist. So we've got to prove this to ourselves. So now let's just use some examples to show how there can't be a special eye. You know, I'll tell you, I'll use the same, always the same examples. I will say a statement now. I have a phone and an iPad, uh, not an iPad, what's it called? A, a thermos, okay? Now, this is one of the logical arguments you have to use. If you make a statement, there's either going to be one thing or more than one thing. So, how, so I, made, I made a statement here. So let's analyze what I just said. How many, how many objects are there? How many nouns, basically? The mind cognizes nouns. There's a phone, I, thermos. That's three phenomena. Now these three, if I say I have a, an iPad and if I have a phone and a, and a thermos, you'll look immediately with your eyes, you'll hear with your ears and you'll, you'll deduce that Rabina just told the truth. And you will see if that's a truth, to prove it, you have to point out three separate phenomena. And you can, there's the phone. And separate here means it doesn't depend upon Rabina or the thermos for its existence. The phone can break, Rabina will be fine, thermos will be fine. So that's the level of that's a level of independence that's the completely independent, not, not only independent, but separate. They're independent and they're separate, which means they don't depend upon each other for their function, for their existence. That's easy to prove. Now I'll make another statement, a bit more nuanced. I have a nose and an ear. So it's going to be the same argument. If this is a true statement, you're going to have to point out three phenomena that are separate from each other. Now, ear, that's easy. Nose, easy. Ear does not depend upon a nose for its function to hear. And nose does not depend upon its ear for it to, to, to blow and to breathe at a simplest level. So these are independent and separate. That's simple. But what about the third phenomenon, I? This is where it gets tricky, isn't it? We believe, what it says, that there is a third component, that there is a separate independent little mini me in there. And this is the argument of a separate intrinsic, you know, and Buddha's and the, and, the, and the Hindus would assert it. The Christians call it a soul. The Greeks call it an essence. The Hindus call it a self. Buddha says, no, nah, sorry, mate, you won't find one. So what's the proof of that? Well, you know, if the ear, if you punch me in the, if Kavita punches me in the ear and blood comes out, I'm going to, my ear is feeling this pain located here. I, you know, so then strictly speaking, the ear is experiencing pain. The nose is basically looking on and going, oh, phew, I'm glad it wasn't me. Phew. And the nose is just fine. There's no pain located here. The nose is untouched because the ear and the nose are separate. Now, we will say, how dare you punch me? And Kovita will say, Rabina, don't be silly. I didn't punch you. I punched your nose. I punched your ear. So if there is that me, that is, if there is the me that is the third component in here, that me, like the nose, will be going, phew, I'm glad it wasn't me that Kovita punched. 
because there'll be a separate me. But there ain't, because we can see straight away. So this is the point. There is a me, but it's more subtle than we think. But it's not a separate me. It, there is a me, but it's not a separate me. So the me is also not the nose and not the ear but you can't separate them. So it's a more nuanced relationship. So there is a me, but not separate. You can't point it out. You can't pinpoint it. It isn't separate, but it is an interdependent me. And it's, an exi and it's finally the name me. This is the final meaning of emptiness. So me is the label you put upon those parts that you constructed from Ikea, you know. So His Holiness says, I is not empty of intrinsic existence because you can't find it. You won't find it. But that's not the real premise. The I is empty of intrinsic independent existence because it's a dependent arising. And finally, because it's merely labeled, which is subtle dependent arising. That's the real meaning, you know. So realizing this in meditation at a subtle level in your shamatha, there'll be one point where for the first time in your entire universal lives that you will see nakedly and clearly that there never has been, is not, and never could be that kind of intrinsic independent I. That's your first moment of the realization of emptiness. And from that second, you become a superior being and you start climbing out of your samsara into your nirvana. You have more work to do, but you cannot fall back after that point. So any questions about that one? So we've got to do the work. Yeah, I have a, I'm sorry. You yeah, join in, yes, sweetheart. I, I do have a question about, Venerable, about, um, I mean, I know we don't, or I understand there's no soul, yeah. there's no me that's going to continue. Yeah. However, Buddhism does have this idea of the mind stream. That's right. And that's going to continue. And I don't yeah. see how that's different. I mean, I know there won't be a Joanna. I understand that. I, I hear your point, Joe. It's very good. It's all a question of learning the way the words are used. Okay. So now, okay. Now, for, now first. Okay, first. The two truths are saying, oh. one, there is a self called Joanne. Conventional truth is there is a self called Joanne. There is an I called Joanne that is existing interdependently, independence upon causes, upon parts, and finally upon the label I or Joanne. And then you can say, ultimately, you will not find any Joanne there among those parts. So Joanne, the in, so there is no independent, separate, independent, intrinsic Joanne. That's emptiness. And as Lama Zobar says, when you've realized that, it's as if there is no Joanne. But conventionally, there is Joanne. But what does exist is so subtle, it's as if she doesn't. So it's this tricky thing of putting together these seeming contradictions that on the one hand, there's no Joanne, ultimate truth. And on the other hand, there is a Joanne, but what it does exist is so subtle, it's as if there's no Joanne. So when we get these two together, then very simply, you would say that yes, if you want to posit any part of Joanne, that bears the label I, it would be your consciousness because that is beginningless and endless, but it too is not intrinsic. So I, Joanne, the I, I is the label. So this life it's called Joanne. Last, last, last life, maybe it was called Mary. Next life, it might be called who knows what, but there is a constant I there that does exist that goes from life to life, but is no, but not intrinsically. So saying there's no Joanne isn't saying there's no Joanne. It's saying there's no intrinsic, independent Joanne. So Joanne does continue from life to life, but that, but, but her name will change. 
the consciousness is the one constant that does continue, but it too is empty of intrinsic nature. Every word we've said about Joanne being intrinsically, not intrinsically existing, is the same for everything, including the consciousness. So it's a tricky, it's just a way of getting these ideas together. I don't know, is that helpful or not, Joanne? Yeah, it takes a lot of chewing on it, but I mean, I, I, know, I guess darling, no, that's, in that's, the other, that's, other that's, systems, the, the soul is thinking of it as a separate intrinsic. What, say that word again, darling. Say what, what did you so say? In other word? traditions, the Christian tradition, yes. the idea yes. of a soul is this okay, I'll tell you the difference. entity. No, I, hear, I think the difference, you see, what we tend to hear when we hear the Buddhist view is, it's a bit like Buddha's kind of like a materialist, oh, there's no soul. He's not saying it as, as gross as that. He is saying, basically, I'd put it this way. The Christian or the, the, the Hindu view of a self, which is similar to the soul, it's, it's, and then the Buddhist view of, 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 an, of, an, of an interdependent self, it's not so much that there's no self. It's not so much that there's not something that continues. It's more the way that it exists. So Buddha's arguing with the view of there being a permanent, uncaused, intrinsic soul or self. It's not chucking the baby out for the bathwater and saying there's nothing, which is the first thing we think when we think nihilism. Oh, there's nothing. No, that's the nihilistic. We fall into the abyss of the great mistake. So when we hear emptiness, we hear nothingness. Then we hear dependent arising and we hear somethingness. And we seem to think these are a contradiction. But when we can put these together and see every time we think dependent arising, it tells us that emptiness is how things are. And every time we hear there is no intrinsic Joanne, it's telling us there's a dependent arising Joanne. So it's a question of putting these two together, but in a much more subtle, nuanced way. So simply... The argument isn't that there's not something that continues. The argument is how it exists, the way it exists. And that's the teaching of dependent arising and emptiness. You with me? Good, Jolene. Thank you, Joanne. Rubina. We got our brains, as Lamy Yeshi put it. Yes, Sasha. Um, is it not self grasping and ego if you stand up for yourself and say no to others who've been abusive and? Disrespect. Well, we've already discussed that and we were saying how well you've done. So what have I missed? What have we missed from your last discussion? Well, when you said smash self-grasping and ego yeah. by putting others yeah. first, then it raised a question in my mind. About well, I hear you, darling. It's very good. It's a question of where you're at, Sasha. So that's what I'm saying as before. It's, it doesn't contradict what I said before. So there's a say, let's say I'm in a relationship. Let's say me, I'm in a crummy relationship and I've got, I've got self-pity. I've got ego grasping. I've got lots of attachment. I've got lots of anger. I'm miserable. I'm suffering. I've got no awareness of my mind. That's a fairly normal person. Then I start, and then I think mean, ugly, husband he's so horrible and then I keep going back like a moth to a flame because I'm scared of what he thinks I'm scared of what people think and I've got no awareness then I start to practice darling then I start to realize my god I've got ego grasping I've got attachment I've got anger and then I realize well I've got to be where I'm at so then at some point I realize I'm going to give up attachment I'm going to stop being you know attached to being seen as a nice girl I'm going to have the courage to realize this is no benefit in this relationship I cannot handle it I'm not ready to do so changing exchanging self for others yet so I'll say I can't handle this bye bye I'm I'm out of here, baby. Of course, there's still self-grasping there, darling, but it's advanced to get rid of that. You've got to go according to your capacity. And at some point, I'll be able to realize emptiness and get rid of the self-grasping altogether. But it's incremental, sweetheart. You've got to go one step at a time. Oh, thank you. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Good, darling. It was a, such a clear question. Thank you, Sasha. Anyone else before we finish? Kevin looks like he's got a question. I don't know. What is it, Kevin? No, nothing, okay. Brian, no question. Joanne had a question, Rosanna, no, Kathleen. So the, I mean, put it this way, the consequence of, of stopping believing in the intrinsic little me, which is fear-based, is that you're fearless. You become fearless. You And as Lama Zopa says, Lama Yeshi put it in his Mahamudra teaching, the very positing of a separate me causes there to be other so when you first you practice compassion and you, you you close the gap between these two and then you get to the root and you uproot the fantasy of a separate me there's no longer a separate sense of self there's no longer me and other your mind is now vast and blissful and radiant and clear and full of empathy and wisdom and clarity 
I mean, how marvelous. Aren't we looking forward to that? That'll do, I think. Don't you think that'll do for now? Food for thought. I'm running out of voice as well. Thank you so much, Venerable Rabina. Thank you. Okay, Tracy. Total pleasure. So food for thought, everybody. We never give up. So do a little dedication prayer. Who's ever going to do it? Um, Who's going to sing it? I'll sing. Or shall I sing? Oh, you, you can sing. go ahead. Gonna... You want me to? No, no, put the prayer up and people can read the words. Okay. We'll just say, I'll say the words in my words. So put the words up and then we can um, just discuss what we're going to do. So here yeah. we're going to have, can't see it, it's very small. Make it bigger. There we go. So dedication, all we're doing is thinking, we've been here together nearly three hours. No, two and a half hours, nearly two and a half. And we're thinking all these thoughts we've had, think this way, it's very marvelous. There's no thought that's go astray, has gone astray. Every one of them has sown a little seed. So we think all these marvelous things we've been thinking, may we continue to nourish these seeds with our practice from this second forward so we can eventually get rid of the ego grasping, get rid of all the delusions, get rid of the self-cherishing, develop love and compassion, become this marvelous person that is our potential right now inside us. May all that happen for my sake and the sake of all suffering sentient beings. And the second little prayer, may this amazing compassionate attitude of the body mind, bodhicitta, this aspiration to never give up benefiting others, may it continue to grow in the hearts of all beings and may it never diminish. We think these thoughts. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you sing. No, you sing, you sing. Come on, you sing. Gewadi. In your do the glama sang, drop your net row, a chick yama, lupa de isa lagapasho, jang chutsem jogrim voce, ma kie panam kie buachi. Kie panyam pame payam, gong ne gong du pel washu. Thank you, sweethearts. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you so much, Krista. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, whoever asked questions, all of you. Sasha, all of you. Donna, everybody. Thank you, darlings. Thank, thank you, Venerable Rovina. Somewhere, sometime, and never give up, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you.